Well, thanks. That's that's a very kind welcome from uh, a friend and a, a colleague. And I'm really happy to be here at this inaugural, we can call it that, Stoicon X Norway. Hopefully, uh, we'll be doing this for years to come. And it's great to see the, the interest and in, in growth in Stoicism. So when, um, when Harald proposed this to me, originally I thought, well, let's talk about things that people run into that are real challenges and problems that come up, you know, like in the Stoic uh, meeting groups, and whether they be face-to-face -face or online or in Facebook, you, know, you notice the largest one has like tens of thousands of people belonging to it. And, and you also notice that a lot of the same problems and challenges keep coming up over and over again. And there's, there's good reasons for that. Um, and then, you know, I, I came on this, I, this sort of title idea of Stoic stumbling blocks, and, and what I mean by them are, are scandalon, uh, things that you, know, you literally trip over or that stand in the way. We'll talk about that in just a bit. And then after I'd given this a lot of thought and we'd talked about it, Harold said, well, you know, the people here are probably not going to be beginners, but much more advanced um, students of Stoicism, people who have a solid background and practice and knowledge. And I thought, well, okay, um, I can still do the same presentation more or less because it's not like Stoicism, just like any other virtue ethics or intentional way of living, it's not like a, a role-playing game or like a video game where you level up and once you make it from level one to level two, you've, you've left level one behind altogether. I think we still run into a lot of the same issues over and over again. Sometimes we have more tools and we've got better perspective on it, but it's not as if I think any of us, unless we're really fortunate, are going to be completely free of these stumbling blocks in our life. And I want to say a little bit about stumbling blocks to begin with. So I mentioned, you know, scandal, the word we get scandal from. Um, in Greek, uh, this is something that you run into and you trip over or you know, it uh, discourages you and dismays you. It steers you aside from where you're going. So I think that's one kind of stumbling block. And then another term that gets used a lot, um, especially in Epictetus, is uh, empodista. The things that it's, it's written as hindrances or um, the things you, you could actually like put on your legs to hobble you. There, there are things that stand in our way and keep us from being able to pursue the path that we want to be on. They restrict us, they interfere with us. And we run into these pretty frequently. Um, there's ways of dealing with them and ways of not being, um, you could say, disabled by them. Um, and, and so I'm going to go into that. Some of these could apply, I think, as well to other modes of intentional living or personal development or philosophy as a way of life. So I think these would arise for people doing uh, living philosophy from an Epicurean perspective or cynic perspective or whatever else we're going to go into because, you know, they're, they're um, a widespread issue that are rooted in our human nature and, and our damaged human nature, our screwed up human nature that we're trying to disentangle and, and straighten out using Stoicism. Um, but then there's some that I think are specific to Stoicism because of the way we've uh, understood things. So we could talk about a lot of other ones, and I think maybe in the Q&A and discussion we, we might. And um, so this is not a comprehensive list that I'm, I'm uh, providing you with. And I think we can also draw a lot from our own experiences and those of others. We're doing that when we read Seneca or read Epictetus and we see them writing to somebody or in Epictetus's case, um, criticizing and haranguing them and sometimes poking fun at them. When we read Marcus Aurelius, we're reading him saying to himself, hey, you schmuck, why don't you get your act together uh, over and over again? And, and, you know, then there's also treatises like, you know, Heracles, uh, fragments of ethics, and we've, we've got a lot of material to work with. So we know that these were issues 
back in the day, although maybe not identified quite so much as such, and, and they're, they're issues for us. So when I was thinking about this uh, and just brainstorming, I came up with a list of 10. This is not the definitive or comprehensive list of stumbling blocks for people interested in, in practicing and understanding Stoicism, um, but I think it, you'll see that these are pretty widespread and common um, problems. And they broke down for me into four categories. Those that have to do primarily with people, those that have to do in particular with things, um, those that have to do with Stoicism itself, understood as a philosophy of life, an intentional way of living, and then those that have to do with measure or perspective, how we how we assess ourselves, how we assess whether we're making progress or not. And so I, I, I'm going to start with the ones with people, but I, I'm just going to read these off to you at the start, so we like in a bullet point form. So with people, expectations that we have of non-Stoic others, then disappointment with those that are identified as Stoics, and a temptation to evangelize in the wrong way. Those are the three that I'm going to talk about here. With things, um, we have almost two opposed examples. Um, being too indifferent to indifference is one of them. And then bringing externals into one's own stoicism is a second one. With stoicism itself understood as a philosophy of life. We have practices that aren't working for somebody. We have expecting too much out of maxims. And then demanding too much out of a mere part of a, a larger system. And then finally, when it comes to measure and perspective, working on everything at once is a big problem that a lot of people fall into. And measuring our failures or plateaus in the wrong ways is, is another Similar problem as well. So let's let's talk about expectations of non-Stoic others. Um, when we tell people that we have found this great thing called Stoicism and it's changing our life for the better, and we embrace it, there is often a tendency to tell other people about it and uh, expect them to respect what we're getting into, and that's crazy because they're not Stoics. So they're more likely, as Epictetus says, he doesn't say a Stoic, he says, if you're going to tell people that you're a philosopher, expect them to test you, expect them to try to provoke you. And if you do this in terms of Stoicism, uh, in part because of the you know, lowercase s use of the word where the Stoic is supposed to be this stiff upper lip and never getting you know, perturbed by anything, if you tell people that you're, you're doing that, they are going to mess with you. So that's probably not a good idea. Um, on the other side, we often expect people, once we've seen the you know, great wisdom and transformative powers of Stoicism, to embrace it themselves, even though they don't have any stake in it. And sometimes this can be quite unfair or oppressive to other people. And it's, it's as you're going to see, that one of the common themes throughout all of these stumbling blocks is... Um, it's not prudent. It's not a good exercise of wisdom to adopt that kind of perspective. Why? Because Stoicism was developed by philosophers, uh, philosophers who were living a life, um, for a world of other human beings who are not themselves Stoics. And that's the origin, that's the context, that will always most likely be the way things are. So it's kind of imprudent to expect reality to change itself because we've adopted some perspective on, on reality. It's also very unfair to expect of other human beings what they can't at this point in time deliver. So I'll give you a prime example one of my um, students in a medical ethics class who uh, was going through a lot of family difficulties, she's also, she's actually a business major at one of the places I teach, she was having a lot of issues coming up and she tried to use the counseling services on campus, found out that they really are just for show and uh, they would give her two sessions and that's it, um, which seems to me, you know, a pretty, pretty, uh, unfortunate and inhumane. And one of her business professors said this to her, you know, there's this thing called stoicism. You should look into it. 
and didn't say anything more. Is, is that a kind, beneficent, just way to treat another person? No, that's, that's the opposite of it. So, so like throwing them out there and, and saying, go read some books and, and it'll sort you out when somebody is in genuine anguish. Now, you know, if she did study stoicism, it would help her with a lot of the things that she's facing. But to demand that at the start of somebody is um, very, you know, it, it's, it's quite imprudent. It's actually foolish. It also doing this, focusing on others um, rather than oneself, that's that's kind of problematic, right? Uh, especially if we're beginners, we're supposed to try to learn how not to pay attention to everybody else's business, the things that are in their control, uh, and to start paying attention to what's in our control. So I think that this is one main source of stumbling blocks. People get much more obsessed with telling everybody else about Stoicism and how they should be Stoics and how great it is, and they focus less on <laughs> what they ought to be doing as Stoics. Uh, now, what about people who are Stoics? we sometimes get disappointed with them. And we feel as if these great, and I'm going to use the word deliberately, idols that we've set on high have fallen down and broken. And how, how could the philosophy be any good if, you know, here, I'll just take a prime example. On Twitter, Massimo Pigliucci uh, sometimes gets, uh, you know, a hard time from people who are like, that's not very stoic of you to criticize another person, you know, or to, to call somebody an a-hole, you know. I, I think, you know, sometimes it's perfectly compatible if a person objectively is an a-hole, a jerk of a certain sort. Um, there's, there's actually, I mean, if you spent all day long tweeting about that, that's a problem. But you know, calling out a person for their behavior strikes me as a matter of justice. You know, it might even involve courage if you're punching up and, and uh, you know, saying something to somebody who could actually um, hurt you. I mean, not that you can actually be hurt on Twitter, right? <laughs> In any important way, but. Um, we often see people who are held up as, as prime examples um, being told that they're letting other Stoics down. Now, we should think about this. There aren't any saviors in Stoicism. This is not Epicureanism, where Epicurus is called Sotor, right? The Cynics had Hercules Sotor as well. And of course, you know, there, for, for Christians, there's, there's a savior figure. Uh, Stoicism doesn't work that way. The sage is not a savior. And when, does it, when do we actually run into sages? I mean, according to the old stuff, every, once every 500 years, we might not see a sage in our lifetime. Um, so who are we actually concerned with? The people that the Stoics identified as, in Greek, prokoptoi, or in Latin, proficientes, the people who are on the way. They're making progress, hopefully, although progress very often looks like a you know, step forward, step back, step forward, step back, less, less of a steady thing all the time. And so we probably want to keep that in mind. Um, and then somebody could retort, yes, but they're the representatives of Stoicism. What about these people who are writing books or, you know, doing podcasts or they're, they're putting themselves forward as an ideal? Well, they're not <clears throat> actually, as far as I know, putting themselves forth as an ideal. That's if, if I take somebody else out there, uh, we'll pick one of my colleagues. Uh, I'll pick somebody who, uh, if any of you have had the privilege of knowing and interacting with, you would say, well, he's, he's a good ways close closer to sagehood than I'll ever be, and he's a really great guy, and that's Christopher Gill. Um, but Christopher Gill might have a bad day and, you know, um, curse out some cab driver while I'm watching him. And then, you know, when I, when I say, that's not very stoic if you turn on me with an angry face and, you know, shout me off the curb or something like that. I mean, I have a hard time imagining Chris doing that, but um, anything could happen, right? If I myself expect some sort of perfection out of Chris Gill, I'm the foolish one. And I'm the one who's allowing myself to be scandalized by doing that. Um, Epictetus, in, in his discourses, brings up how different people who he thinks are not quite sages, but, but at least on the way, um, Socrates, Zeno, Diogenes, each one of them had a very different approach. 
He tells us that, you know, Zeno stuck to teaching, Socrates went around questioning people, Diogenes basically got in people's faces in a very aggressive way, and each one of these was a legitimate way of doing the sort of thing that, that Epictetus thought mattered for Stoicism. So that, that's a second uh, potential stumbling block that we want to avoid. A third is evangelizing or advocating Stoicism in the wrong way. I, I'm not against trying to spread good words about things, which is what evan you know, evangelizing is at its core, but I think a lot of times people go about that the wrong way. And, it, and it's understandable that if you found something that's helpful for you in your life, you would want to share it with others. That is indeed part of beneficence, which is a part of justice, right? Um, but there is a tendency, I think, among many people, not just in Stoicism, but any sort of thing that improves your life. And it could be a philosophy, it could even be a diet or exercise, to say, this works for me, so therefore it must work for you, and you should be doing this. Um, think about the advice that we get as soon as we tell somebody that we're doing a new kind of exercise. Oh, well, you should be lifting a different way, the way that I do it, the way that I think you should do it. Um, and so I think a lot of evangelizing works like that. You know, taking cold showers is, is changing my life. You should all take cold showers too. You know, um, what we need to do instead, of, we, it's not that we can't say, hey, this is helpful, you should try this, but we always have to exercise the reserve clause. We always have to say, how invested am I getting in that person changing their mind and their behavior? I can communicate information to them. I don't have to expect them to change to, to suit me. We also might want to keep in mind something else that Epictetus uh, brought up with respect to Socrates. How often did Socrates succeed? Epictetus tells it, it was one in a thousand, right? That's you know, imagine if you were a doctor and you saved one out of a thousand of your patients. You probably wouldn't stay a doctor very long. Fortunately, the stakes are lower when you're just talking to people. But, you know, Socrates didn't allow that to discourage him uh, from, from doing that. And we probably should expect about that sort of uh, rate of rate of return as well. Um, we want to think, if, we, if we're going to communicate with people about Stoicism, we want to practice the virtues. So it's not just about courage, being bold enough to tell the story. It's also about prudence. How do we talk to people? Um, do we do it in the right way, at the right time, presenting things in the amount that people can take in? Um, sometimes waiting and not saying anything is the most, pro most prudent thing to do. Um, Justice, this is also where, once again, the expectations of non-Stoic others, if somebody is really struggling, somebody is really suffering, somebody is dealing with difficult stuff, um, merely telling them they should practice Stoicism does not strike me as a, a just way to behave. It's actually quite cruel instead. Um, what we can do is create opportunities for people to learn about Stoicism, but then, like I, I said before, we have to exercise that reserve clause. We have to realize that they have to see the, the point to it. Um, we can't force that on them. When we turn to thinking about things, the whole world of, of things that we're involved in, a, a big stumbling block for Stoics is this notion of indifference with a TS rather than indifference as an attitude. They both come from the same Greek adiaphora, uh, the things that literally don't make a difference, right? A prime example of this is the amount of hairs on your head, whether it's even or odd. That's one of the examples that Diogenes Laertes and um, uh, Arius Didymus both give. Another very interesting example, the color of one's skin. Uh, the Stoics in, in ancient times thought that that doesn't really matter at all. That, that's a total indifferent. It's neither good nor bad because they had very different understandings of ethnicity, race, um, markers for that than we unfortunately do it in our world. Right? So that, that might be something to follow up on down the line. Indifference do in fact matter from a Stoic perspective. There was a Stoic who is a, a renegade um, who uh, gets talked about by Cicero and, and by Diogenes Laertes, who said that the indifference, oh, we just don't care about them at all, right? That's not the position of Zeno or the later Stoics who we study. Indifference do matter. 
They just don't matter as much as virtue and vice, or happiness and misery. So wealth does matter. Poverty does matter. It just doesn't matter enough to make you happy or miserable, or a good person or a bad person. And I think a lot of people, when they learn about Stoicism, they wind up taking an all-or-nothing approach, where they they express themselves saying things like, you know, it's it's Stoic. Uh, there was a thing on Twitter about this a while back. It's really Stoic to not give a, an f about anything. Well, that's completely wrong. You know, that would be imprudent. That would be unjust. That's not even courageous, because courage in the real sense means you know, resisting things and standing up for things and combating the things that, that really do, in fact, uh, matter. And some of those might be indifference, because as Epictetus points out to us, things that are indifferent or external to us, things that are outside our control, how we deal with them, how we make use of them, the chresis in Greek, really does matter and is up to us and is a matter for pro-racists, for our, our choice about things. Um, so we really we, we do want to think about how we maintain this kind of tension, right? Clearly the indifference do matter to some degree. How do we determine when they matter, why they matter? Well, that's where the things that, that are more valuable have to come into play, like the virtues, uh, which include prudence. There's a there's a opposite sort of scandal, I think, that people do, which trips themselves up, and they don't realize it as a way in which they're deviating themselves from, from where they want to go. And that's bringing externals into their stoicism itself, getting too concerned about things that don't really matter as if they're part of their stoic practice. And some of that we're going to get to a little bit later when we talk about proper measure. I think a great example of this is stoic merch and tattoos. People think that if they buy themselves a challenge coin, which is a weird practice anyway. There's a whole other conversation to have about how challenge coins, which were a rarity when I was in the, the U.S. military, have become you know this this inflated sign that almost anybody can you know get them get their hands on. There's a whole story to be told there about it. Um, having a coin of any sort doesn't make you any more stoic. It might be a useful aid to memory, but you know it'd be an even more useful aid to memory remembering stuff in your head, <laughs> developing a practice where you don't actually need to have something in your pocket to, to whip out and um, you know, display your connection with the, the Stoic community. A lot of people get, get tattoos, and I see a lot of posts about this. And I, I'm, not, you know, I'm not saying that this is a terrible thing or anything, but it, it really does lose perspective. There's nothing about putting ink on an indifferent, which is your body, according to Stoicism, traditionally understood, um, that is going to make you more Stoic, right? And it doesn't matter whether you write it in Greek or Latin or English or Norwegian or pick whatever you want. I mean, do pick a language that you, you know, because otherwise you'll be like those people who get, you know, characters like Chinese characters and it spells like a menu item or something. Uh, and then you look kind of silly. But Merch, tattoos, <clears throat> those are things that apply to the indifference. Um, I think there's a lot of people as well who do focus on more on belonging and signaling and social status within the Stoic community and less about um, their own practice. You know, this is, this is a, a way of shifting concern outward into the world where you're likely to be disappointed. This, this lays you up for some of those other things, like thinking that stoic figures are somehow saintly uh, types. I mean, even saints, understood in Christian context, a lot of them were kind of kind of uh, you know flawed characters too, right? So um, stoic prokoptoi are, are going to be as well. The last thing that I think falls under there, and, and some people might not be happy to hear this, buying books. Um, you can have too many books. Seneca says this explicitly. <laughs> you, unless you're actually reading the books and they're the right books, because there's a lot of you know good books and a lot of bad books out there on on Stoicism. Um, 
you're not actually improving yourself. You're not helping your stoic practice and internalized philosophy by putting books on a shelf. Lucian, who, who is not a stoic, Lucian of, of uh, Samosoda, has a very funny piece called The Ignorant Book Buyer. And it's about a guy who lines his uh, study with all these books that he's buying and thinks that simply acquiring them by, you know, force of osmosis or ownership is going to make him a smarter guy. And he's as, he's as ignorant as you could possibly be. Um, I think some people do that at times with, with stoicism. And like I said, this is, a, this is a stumbling block where people trip themselves up while they're actually thinking they're doing a good thing for themselves. What about um, stoicism itself? So stoicism is a practical philosophy. There are what Hado calls spiritual exercises, most people just call them philosophical practices that you engage in, ranging from identifying what's in your control, what's not in your control, to negative visualization, to you know voluntary discomfort. You guys all know the whole gamut of, of these sorts of things. Um, practices don't always work for everybody. I, I take cold showers. Uh, but I don't do it as a matter of course to like toughen myself up because, you know, I usually take a cold shower when I get out of the sauna at the gym because it's nice to cool down. You know, the same practice can do very different things. Um, there's a dialectic between practice and study and reflection. The more practice you do, uh, it helps you understand Stoic philosophy, and then the Stoic philosophy should be informing the practice, and they should be building off of each other. Um, doing practices just by themselves, just for the sake of doing practices, is not really Stoicism. John Sellers um, points this out in, in an interview that we did with him on a radio show a while back, and it was really Great to hear him say that, that just doing practices is not, um, not enough. There's also kind of a relativity to practices. Not every practice is for every person. And if you try a practice and it doesn't work out for you, that doesn't mean that stoicism has failed. And it doesn't even mean necessarily that you have failed or that you're doing it wrong, right? It could mean that that practice is just not going to ever pay off for you, or it's not going to pay off at this point in time, you know, or you're not in the right kind of situation for it. Some people shouldn't do negative visualization. Donald Robertson has pointed this out when it comes to people who have been, you know, terribly traumatized. Um, if you are dealing with some really deep-rooted trauma from abuse, then trying to think about the thing that's a trigger for you might not be the best idea to do at this point in time, right? So even negative visualization, which gets, gets recommended as a universal uh, panacea, it's, it's not that. You have to be, again, prudent in, in which practices you take on. Another important aspect that we're going to talk a little bit more about later, routines, um, stoic routines, practice routines, can in fact become routine. They can become mindless and stale, and um, then they're probably not going to be helping you out, and you have to reassess over and over again. So I, I think that putting practices in a proper perspective is very important for avoiding this, this particular stumbling block. On the other side, so we have practices, things that you do. We have things that you say or things that you read or things that you think, maxims, right? What we nowadays call quotes, um, passages that are taken out of text. Some of them are recommended by people like Epictetus when he says, have ready at hand when you get into this sort of situation to say to yourself X, Y, Z. Marcus is in fact saying those things to himself in the meditations. Seneca has a whole letter about these, which I highly recommend to all of you, uh, where somebody is asking him for quotes and he says, eh, I'm not going to give you any for, for these reasons here. Uh, and then he relents and says, eh, why not? I'll give you a few. And, and he gives, gives them some. Um, 
maxims, just like practices, are contextual. They are not helpful for every single situation. You have to understand the maxim in order for it to be of any use to you. Um, they require unpacking. There's a lot of quotes out there that people like to post and write down for themselves and repeat to themselves. Seneca is super clear about this. Without some sort of connection to the larger Stoic system, they're losing most of their efficacy. And some of them can actually be um, dangerous or damaging to you if you're misusing them. You know, telling yourself, for example, as you go through a bad breakup that, you know, this, this appearance is nothing to me, that's probably not going to be good for you, right? So you want to be prudent in, in how you uh, use your maxims. Um, some of them, you know, are actually, uh, they need a lot of unpacking. A great example is the obstacle is the way. Is the obstacle really the way in every single case? Sometimes the obstacle is just the obstacle. You know, and sometimes you would be foolish to keep on butting your head against that particular obstacle. Uh, sometimes you want to go around the obstacle. That might be the way, but the obstacle itself isn't the way. So we, we could do this with all sorts of other uh, Stoic passages, quotes, maxims, whatever you want to call them. We need to be rational as we're thinking them through and applying them rather than just parroting them as if they're going to magically help us. Um, and this leads to, to another sort of source of stumbling blocks. People will seize upon parts of Stoicism as if it's the totality of Stoicism. The best example of this is the dichotomy of control. I've seen people saying Stoicism, you know, the foundation of it or the essence of Stoicism is the dichotomy of control. That shows up very, very late in Stoic philosophy. The first person to explicitly formulate it, Epictetus, right? We don't know if it was in some of the classic Stoics like uh, Zeno and Chrysippus. It might have been. Um, we see things sort of like it in Cicero uh, describing Stoicism. It, we see some things like it in uh, Seneca. Um, we also, in the epitome of, of Stoic you know, uh, ethics and in Diogenes Laertes, we don't see an emphasis on the dichotomy of control. So we should be really wary in that case and in other cases of saying this is the only thing that counts. This is the, the cornerstone. As Seneca tells us, Stoicism is a complex system. It's better to think of it less as a single star and more like an entire constellation. And not a, not a simple one like the Big Dipper, you know, but a really complicated one. Or you might think of it like a mosaic where you need all these different pieces in the composition. Now, that might lead to some dismay. You can say, well, I, I haven't read all the Stoic texts or, you know, how am I going to learn all of this stuff? And, you know, it's something that we grow into. It's something that we build within ourselves. You can have a more and a less. Um, but you don't want to hold yourself back by saying, I've got it figured out. Um, I've got everything that I, I need. Now we come to the last two. And here we're dealing with um, things that have to do with how we measure our success and how we, how we plan things out. It's a big mistake, recognized not just by Stoics, but also by other authors. A prime example of this is John Cassian, the, uh, one of the great monastic writers uh, in, in the West. Working on everything at once, thinking that you're going to change every single part of yourself is setting yourself up for failure. You can generally only work on a bit of yourself at a time. And this is in part because, as Epictetus teaches us, we are proiracis. We are our faculty of choice. And proiracis compels proiracis. You are using a higher part of yourself to look at, to unscrew up that very part of yourself. So you can't change it all at once. You know, you have to be selective on what you're going to work on and forgiving with yourself for all of your screw ups when it comes to other things. So if like your big thing is anger management, but you also ought to, you know, exercise some temperance and eating and drinking, maybe work on the anger management first. And after you've actually got that halfway down, now you can start worrying about dieting and exercise and, you know, not having 
fifth helpings at the buffet or whatever it's going to be, right? And we could we could do vice versa with that as well. But you you really can't do everything at once. And if you try to, you're going to fail and you're going to feel really bad about it and it will probably lead you away from yet one more failed system that you've invested in uh, for a while. The last thing is measuring failure or plateaus. Um, we're all going to screw up. And, you know, again, the classic Stoics, they talk about this. They all say that they've screwed up. Uh, Marcus is actually haranguing himself sometimes. And we want to keep this in proper perspective. We don't want to hide things from ourselves and say, oh, I didn't really screw up, or the great thing that I'm going to do tomorrow will totally make up for this. <laughs> I think many of, many of us have fallen into that trap. I know I certainly have. Um, but we're not just simply going back to square one. You know, we build up practice over a while, and we change ourselves gradually. So reminding ourselves that when we fail, we have the opportunity to not fail the next time and to make something of it can help take some stress off of ourselves. Um, sometimes when we've been practicing for a while, we feel like we hit a plateau and we're just idling along. Um, Travis Hume, uh, the applying stoicism organizer. He and I have been talking about this for a while and I told him about, you know, the concept of the dark night of the soul and, you know, spiritual progress. This is something that the stoics didn't themselves thematize that much, but I think is is really quite common. You've actually made some progress and now you're just kind of idling along. Well, you're not just idling along. If you're if you're still reading, you're still thinking, you're still behaving, you're still choosing you are slowly growing something within yourself, and you can remind yourself of that. If you don't, there's a tendency to say, ah, this is just boring routine, why should I keep doing this? And that's allowing yourself to be scandalized, allowing yourself to have impediments thrown in your way. So those are the 10 that I thought were you know, worth talking about. There's lots of other ways. There's like an infinite amount of ways, uh, if Aristotle's right, that we can go wrong. Um, but I thought those those might be um, common, helpful ones that I saw a lot of nodding heads a lot of us can relate to. Um, I've done probably all of them at one point in time, not necessarily with stoicism, but at least with something. Um, I'm willing to bet that quite a few of you have as well. And so I look forward to, um, you know, digging into this a bit deeper as we, we continue our conversation. I've talked at you enough, and thanks for uh, coming along for the ride on this, and hopefully it's been helpful.